The war in Afghanistan could have been a very different story. US and Allied forces could have successfully withdrawn from the country in 2002, having done the job they were sent out to do, to defeat Al-Qaeda. Instead, in the years that followed, the Allies paid a devastating price for their presence, and in 2001, the US withdrew from the country in what are now infamous scenes of chaos and hasty retreat. I'm your host, James Patton Rogers, and on today's Warfare podcast, we're looking into how the Taliban ultimately won in Afghanistan. To find out, I travelled to Sydney in Australia to sit down with one of the world's leading experts and key policy advisors on the conflict, Professor Theo Farrell. Theo is the author of Unwinnable, Britain's War in Afghanistan, published by Penguin. And it's from his experience in country and through his negotiations with the Taliban that he helps us to understand exactly what went wrong. Hi, Theo. Welcome to the Warfare Podcast. How are you doing? You well? Thanks, James. I just had my morning coffee. I'm doing very well. Well, it's great to have you on the podcast. As we start, I guess we're, we're marking the post Afghan war world. We're 18 months since that botched withdrawal from Afghanistan by the West, by the coalition forces. I mean, when I say botched, would you agree with that kind of description of what happened in August 2021? I mean, we had drone strikes that accidentally targeted civilians. There were suicide bombs going off in and around Kabul airport. There were people hanging on the edges of, of planes. It was harrowing, tragic scenes. And of course, you had the, the death of US soldiers as well. Could it have gone any better? Yeah, no, and what's quite interesting, even before you get to the evacuation of Kabul, which is what you're describing yes. in August of 2021, if you look at the events in June through July and August, where we see urban center after urban center, major town, and then city after city falling to the Taliban so quickly, and the collapse of the Afghan state, which just happened over a matter of weeks, really, that's what invites you to think about, well, actually, what's going on here? This looks like a catastrophic failure of Western policy. So the, the evacuation, which was this disaster, this rush out of Kabul, was just simply the final, the very final act of what was a disastrous end of a war. And yes, that invites the question, well, have we seen here what's going on? Have we seen a catastrophic failure of Western policy? And the short answer is yes. Unfortunately, you know, this is a good example of where the Biden administration was building on the failures of so many previous American administrations but certainly didn't do anything whatsoever to reverse that failure trajectory. And in many ways, what the Biden administration did when they accelerated the withdrawal of U.S. forces against a political timeline is they, they then accelerated the failure of U.S. policy. Was it something that had been decided by the Biden administration, or was this already set in motion by the Trump administration beforehand? Arguably, it was set in motion, actually, if you go back to the Obama administration, it was set in motion. So in 2010... Both the uh, British government under Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, but also the Biden administration, had effectively taken the view that uh, Western combat forces would withdraw from the field, and by 2014, Afghan security forces would be responsible for combating the, the Taliban, and the West would move to a position of train and assist. This was the drawdown, the infamous drawdown, I suppose you would call it. This was the, and here I'm doing the kind of inverted commas with my fingers, this was the conditions-based drawdown. Yes. So over this period from 2010 to 2014, as conditions improved, by which those conditions would be the growing capacity of Afghan security forces, uh, the steady withdrawal of the Taliban in the field, uh, then Western forces would withdraw back to a training assist posture and hand over to the Afghans. In reality, of course, that wasn't, and here I'm doing my inverted commas again, conditions-based withdrawal, but it was on a political timeline i.e. no matter what, by December 2013, we'll hand over uh, to Afghan security forces to take responsibility and we will move to a training assist posture. So that kind of starts the clock already. Then, of course, Trump wins in November of 2016. He made no secret of the fact that he thought the whole thing was a fiasco. Trump was looking for a success. Yeah. And I mean, let's face it, with Trump, it's never about what's in the U.S. national interest. It's what makes Trump look good. And so the net result of that is there's a real determination by the Americans to reach an agreement with the Taliban that would enable a complete American withdrawal. And this is the Doha agreement that's agreed in 2020. And that is the death knell of the Afghan state, the Afghan security forces, the whole enterprise. 
So, so why is that? I mean, I've got so many questions that I could ask you here, but let's talk about the Doha Agreement. What does that state that means that Ashraf Ghani's entire presidency is going to collapse within a matter of months? Because like you say, the whole point of this is that by 2014, you're going to have this strong nation state in Afghanistan. You're going to have these forces that can hold their own against a seemingly relentless, unstoppable Taliban who can absorb so many losses that the world's greatest military can't seem to defeat them. But the Afghans themselves can hold off against them, in theory at least. They fall apart within within a matter of weeks. So what is it about the Doha Agreement that means that that takes place? And here, of course, I think we both recognize we're starting at the end of the story. We are. And, yes. and I, I guess in a moment we will go back to the beginning. But look, the end is very dramatic, so it's good that we're starting here. Basically, in Doha, the Americans and the Taliban reach a deal. The Americans agree that they're going to stop bombing the Taliban. And the Taliban agree that they won't launch major attacks against cities. So there's a kind of agreement the Americans say, well, if you do certain things, it's there's some secret annexes that we've never seen. But broadly speaking, the Americans say, if you do certain things, we will bomb you. But provided you don't do those things, we won't bomb you. And it gives the Taliban pretty much free reign. So what they're able to do is they can overrun army bases. They can overrun uh, smaller towns. The Taliban try and test the bounds of the Doha Agreement. Uh, within a couple of months, they attack Lashkar, which is the provincial capital in Helmand, which is where the British were operating. Then the Americans do bomb them. And then the Taliban go, OK, we can basically we now know where we stand. We can attack anything except for capitals or, or uh, provincial capital. And so by basically the Americans saying we won't use air power against you, they are effectively withdrawing support for the Afghan army and, and police. Because the Afghan army and police are trying to hold the Taliban at bay. They're operating from bases all over the country. And frequently, the Taliban will try and overrun a base. And when that happens, the one thing that holds the Taliban at bay is American air power that turns up and bombs them back. And what happens instead uh, after Doha, so this is sort of from mid-2020 onwards, is the Afghan army or police will be on the ground. They'll be facing the prospect of the Taliban overrunning them. They'll call in American air power. American planes will fly overhead, but not drop any bombs. Okay, so a show of force. Just kind of see what's happening, right? Oh, right. Okay, so this isn't even about it. No. It isn't the Taliban. It's no, just no. checking what's going on. Checking what's going on. Because, of course, the Taliban know that they're not going to bomb them. Right. So it's not when you show of force. And what it does is it causes Afghan security force morale to collapse because they're seeing that the West has stopped supporting them. And the Taliban know it, and they know it. Right, I see. And is it the case... In those, in those final weeks, as that withdrawal takes place, the, the, there is a limited air power capacity for the Afghan forces. They have helicopters, for example, and some drone systems. But the US also removes all technical support. So there's no engineers or, or, or kind of flight crews, technicians to keep these things running. And so they can't either, with their own kind of smaller air power capacity, hold the Taliban at bay. Yeah, so I mean... There are some parts of the Afghan security forces that are very capable and have built up capacity. So the Afghan Commando Corps, basically, which is about 8% of their security forces, they are very capable. And they are basically the, the emergency force that flies around to try and hold the Taliban at bay. And, you know, they're, and they're air mobile, very capable. They are supported by a quite large Western contractor base who will do the servicing of the airframes, who will provide support for electronic countermeasures and so forth. So... At the time of Doha in 2020, there are 8,500 American troops in Afghanistan. By the time Biden comes into office in you know, January 2021, we're down to 2,500 troops. That's nothing, right? They're just like a small force. But their presence enables thousands of civilian, Western civilian contractors to be in Afghanistan. Yeah. And they're the people who are servicing the airframes and the electronic and wires and so forth. When, when the American forces withdraw altogether, all of these Western contractors come out. And so all of a sudden, the high-end capacity that the Afghan security forces have stopped working because there's no one there to service them. And then you have that tipping point where the Taliban are buoyed, they're confident, and they know they can get victory. And so they make that charge on Kabul. But like you said, we've focused too much on the present. This is a history podcast after all. And I, I guess, I mean, we're well over 20 years since the start of the war in Afghanistan. What do they say in 20 years is, is military history, I think? I mean, I don't know how old that makes you feel, but it certainly gets me on the way. So take us back 
into this history. There's, there's many times that the war in Afghanistan was won. I think the first time it was won was in November 2001, when the UN Security Council already starts to turn towards nation building in Afghanistan. Some people say that if there was a withdrawal in 2002, before the war in Iraq, then that could have been seen as a victory. Um, but it was that twist and turn towards nation building itself. Some spoke about turning Afghanistan into, was it Belgium within three years or Bangladesh within 30 or something? I mean, it, it was a, a slow downward spiral in terms of the war itself. Was there at any point during that entire history that we're talking about, and you've been heavily involved in this during the entirety of the conflict, that the war was winnable? Yeah, look, it's... I I've, an easy question for you, Theo. Uh, thanks, James. And I should perhaps, you know, I should perhaps put my cards on the table for listeners. The book I wrote about this, about the British campaign, is entitled Unwinnable. Yeah. <laughs> so you probably get a sense of where I'm coming from. But you're absolutely right to look at this initial early period. Uh, so, you know, obviously a month or so after the 9-11 attacks against the United States, the United States deploys CIA covered ops teams into Afghanistan and they bring suitcases full of cash, and they bring uh, laser designators for bombings. But basically, they provide a material support to the anti-Taliban Northern Alliance, enables the targeting of Taliban front lines by American air power, and lots of cash to buy off people. And there's a round at Al-Qaeda as well, and troops on horseback go through Diyarbakir yeah. mountains, you know, all these things that we've seen. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're, we're deep into sort of a Sylvester Stallone kind of territory. We are, yeah. Uh, but look, a very successful, you know, campaign that's led against the Taliban. Taliban forces collapse, and we know that what happens by the end of 2001, the Taliban have basically fled to Pakistan, Al Qaeda, likewise. The remaining people, of Taliban, uh, who are in Afghanistan, have basically gone to ground. They've buried their weapons. They've gone back to villages. And the question is, what happens then? Now, the view of the Bush administration at the time uh, was that we don't want to get involved in nation building. Mm -hmm. So the Bush administration had no interest in nation building. They George Bush Jr. had learned the lessons from George Bush Sr., yep. right? George Bush Sr., his father, had deployed 28,000 U.S. forces into Somalia, a similar-sized country, uh, in 1992, uh, to try and just provide some humanitarian assistance in Somalia. That mission had collapsed spectacularly. And so the view of the Bush administration was, we don't want to get involved in nation-building. That's not our beef. So why did we see nation building occur in Afghanistan? That's a really important question because so many of the key officials of the Bush administration are those of his father as well. Your Rumsfeld, your Cheney. The argument is that, you know, the president himself, George Bush Jr., is a, is a bit of a puppet to their games and maybe a little bit of uh, unfinished business for these officials. So how do they get drawn into nation building? Yeah. And here, of course, and, and I, you know, I, that was a like great podcast that you did previously about Tony Blair and Iraq. Yes, and, James Strong. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that's, and, and definitely I would recommend that to listeners because there are themes across the two. Uh, because in that, of course, yourself and James talking about the conviction that is driving Blair around Iraq. And there's that great discussion around Blair can see that there isn't a legal case for war in Iraq, but he's strong a conviction that it's the right thing to do. And there's something similar here. So essentially, Tony Blair is the man that's responsible for nation building in Afghanistan. He's the driving force behind it. So we see the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan called ISAF. That originally was a force that went in December 2001 into Kabul just to secure Kabul. Its job was just to secure the government in Kabul. It was a very contained mission. Okay. That then becomes the mission to bring nation building to the whole of Afghanistan in a matter of years. Is that because they think Kabul has been a success there? Is this trying to hold up, is it Hamid Karzai at this point in time, and to kind of make sure that he can push his power out further and increase the legitimacy of the government? It's part of that. So initially the force goes into Kabul because the concern was the Northern Alliance would sweep in. Mm. This is a Tajik Uzbek alliance would sweep into Kabul and we'd see atrocities. They knew in, against Taliban, mostly Pashtun Taliban regime that had been empowered in Kabul. So it was a concern about sending in a peacekeeping force to stop atrocities and to protect the new government of uh, Hamid Karzai. But just think about where where's Tony Blair's head at in, in late 2001, early 2002. What we have in 1998 in the United Kingdom is the Strategic Defence Review, the SDR. And coming out of that is a view that the 
The United Kingdom should be a force for good in the world. So this is what leads to Kosovo in 1999. This leads to the adoption of the, of the, of the international community. This leads to this view that Britain can use military force for humanitarian and other knowledge purposes in the world. And there's also a second theme in the SDR. So everyone focuses on that, but there's a second theme in the SDR, which is the world is a global village, basically. And it's much better that we go to crises than have crises come to us. Now, the attacks that occur against the United States in September of 2001, in Blair's mind, confirmed this. Because effectively, because Afghanistan had been allowed to slip into this semi-governed space, and we see Al-Qaeda established training camps in Afghanistan, Afghanistan had slipped into crisis in the 1990s, had provided the space for terrorist organizations to organize attacks against the West. Very good example of how the West is much better going into these spaces, using military force to secure them, than rather allow them to be places in which insecurity can spill out into the West. So these are the twin motives. It's about being a force for good, but it's also about trying to project security into ungoverned spaces. Do you think something like that could, could happen today? I mean, we look back at this and we think, how naive, or at least I do anyway. But actually, when you look at the political context of the moment, you've got to think about not only the shock of 9-11, and, and we discussed this in the podcast you mentioned with James Strong, but also being buoyed by the successes of Kosovo, the first perfect cost-free war in the eyes of NATO. And also the fact that there was a sustained and continued flow of terrorist attacks during this period in time. So, of course, you had the, the Madrid bombings a little bit later on. You had the 7-7 the bombings. You had continued threats on the West, both in the United States and across Europe. And remember, Afghanistan is seen as the good war, the legal war, the legitimate war. It's about trying to stop another 9-11 happening again. So is it all of those things in that particularly specific and important moment that really make Blair overconfident uh, that he has all of this support and that he can achieve these things quite, I mean, incredibly ambitious, achieve, incredibly ambitious objectives when it comes to war. Yeah, and it's interesting, I mean, Blair uh, certainly has no shortage of, uh, of ambition and competence, um, that's for sure. And of course, hubris, we're talking about hubris here, really. And it's a really good example, you and I, you know, we both study wars, you know how it's a set of contingencies that lead to these outcomes. And that's what we see here. So it's initially Blair saying, we need to deploy force to secure these areas to avoid peacekeeping forces. Uh, and then, of course, we want to try and bring some governance and security to this, to this country because... That was, you know, that was the absence of governance and security that generated the problem in the first place. In early 2002, the Bush administration was not interested in nation building. Mm -hmm. They were already preparing for Iraq and the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So they've already turned their attention in early 2002 to preparing for the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. But the, and it was Blair that was pushing this agenda. So what happens then that brings the rest of nation into Afghanistan? And that's the next part of the puzzle. And what happens is, is the catastrophic row that breaks out across the Atlantic over over the war in Iraq. So early, of course, what we get it is in, in you know early 2003, a terrible breakdown in relations uh, between the, the French and the Germans and a number of the European powers on one hand and the Americans and the Brits on the other over the war in Iraq, which they, for many European states they see as an illegal war. And this, the political, there's no political support. Uh, it was being described by some you know very senior officials in the United States as as well as the death of NATO, relations were so poisoned, it was so, such a terrible breakdown of relations. Then, of course, the Americans and the British go to war in Iraq, and then attention turns in Europe to how can we repair relations with America. We have to repair relations. And so a view is taken that, okay, well, we've got this kind of conflict in Afghanistan that's stabilized, but there's a lot of insecurity there, and the Americans are very busy in the war in Iraq. And so the view in NATO is, well, why don't we offer to take on the mission to secure Afghanistan off the Americans to let them concentrate in Iraq? So we don't have to get involved in Iraq, but we will take on the mission in Afghanistan, and this will be a bridge whereby we can repair relations with the Americans. And so that's where NATO informally suggests to Hamid Karzai that the, that the Afghan government might like to invite NATO to take on the mission to secure Afghanistan. And this is in August 2003, and that's what Kar Karzai government does, and NATO formally takes on responsibility for the mission 
And that then takes a couple of years. So it takes a couple of years for the NATO machinery to spin up. The Germans quite quickly deploy forces to Afghanistan. And by 2004, we see ISAF spread out to the northern Afghanistan and western Afghanistan. And as we get into 2005 and 2006, ISAF expands into the south and the east. And so by degrees, we see a Western commitment to nation building. But this is driven by NATO politics, firstly by Blair's doctrine and his belief, then by NATO politics. Afghan considerations come low on that list of what's driving this. And here we can start to look at more of the international landscape of the war in Afghanistan. We focus on the United States and, and, and Britain as, as majority force deployments. But there is a far more international force. And, and the legacies of that withdrawal, we're going to call it a botch withdrawal now, the botch withdrawal from Afghanistan. The legacies of that are that, you know, a number of my friends and colleagues who served felt incredibly let down, betrayed. It brought back a lot of emotions about what had happened there, the sacrifices that had been made, friends who had been killed. And that's just my colleagues in, in the British military. What was it like here in Australia? a country that had deployed forces into Afghanistan, 302 fatalities and casualties during that period. Was there a similar kind of feeling that, you know, why had we gone into this conflict? Why had we sacrificed so much only for everything to come tumbling down? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Now, I have to say I'm uh, probably more familiar with the British experience. And of course, at the time, I did quite a bit of work with the Ministry of Defence and ISAF forces. So I'd spent quite a bit of time with the British military as this war was being prosecuted. But, you know, there's obviously lots of ongoing media reporting of the war here. There's a very strong culture in Australia. In many ways, as strong and in some respects, perhaps even stronger than Britain in terms of remembering past conflicts. The commitment to the public history of past conflicts is very strong. Just walking around Sydney, you see the war memorials yeah. almost on every corner. And Australia has been an incredibly loyal allies. Some historians might argue to a fault with Australia's commitment in Vietnam, for example, where other nations wouldn't follow the United States. Australia followed. It has always been there side by side. And indeed, look, I, I had a reason to be in the ISAF headquarters in Kabul on a number of occasions doing work uh, with them and, and worked alongside Australian officers. And essentially what happened as the war progressed, as we get into a bit later, into 2009, 2010, the Bama administration brings a new disc into the war we see a formidable commander being appointed, General Stanley McChrystal. He'd led to the Special Forces counterinsurgency campaign in, in Iraq very successfully. You know, a really innovative uh, commander who interestingly brought a focus on the political aspects of the conflict in Afghanistan. He was really, you know, ahead of his time in that respect. But what was quite interesting, you know, if you were in the, in the ISAF headquarters in Kabul, there was an inner circle of American, British, and Australian officers who were the trusted group. And very often, the Americans worked closely with the British and the Australians, both as a mark of their professionalism, but also in respect of the political commitment to those countries to the war effort. And even though the ISAF headquarters was very multicultural, all different nations were there, what you actually had was an inner circle of officers who were doing the intelligence and the planning and the, uh, the management of operations. And those were the countries that were the inner circle where, where there was most sharing of intelligence. I didn't know that. That's fascinating yep. to learn. Now, you were involved in, in, in those discussions. You were there in those headquarters. But I believe you were also involved in discussions with the Taliban on, on no less than, than three occasions. I was doing a little bit of research for this video, and I think you were with the Taliban when it was announced that President Trump had won the election. Yep. That must have been a strange moment. Uh, very strange. Yeah, and it was interesting. So... I would reason, as yourself, as someone who then subsequently became a historian of the conflict, it did provide me with you know, rather good access to information, which I was able to use for my history. But basically, you know, I did quite a lot of work with uh, ISAF headquarters. I was involved in various reviews of the war plan and tried to provide advice to the commanding officers around areas that the war plan could be improved. But also then subsequently was involved in a series of talks with senior Taliban figures and those were around building capacity within the Taliban. Firstly, understanding the Taliban positions on potential negotiations. Because there wasn't an awful lot, there was very little contact between uh, the United States and the Taliban prior to 2011. So try to figure out where the middle ground is, if there is any. Absolutely. What were Taliban red lines? Where was the potential middle ground? And then subsequently, and this is working with um, a man called Michael Semple, who's sort of a leading authority of the Taliban, and himself has extensive links into various 
and constituencies within the Taliban at the time. How can we also help the Taliban build its thinking and capacities around peacemaking? And so we we were engaged in one set of, of discussions with a range of Taliban leaders from different constituencies from the Taliban in an island in the Pacific. And one morning when over breakfast, when it was announced that Trump had won the election, I have to confess, you know, we went to bed expecting Hillary Clinton to be elected. So it was a bit of a pleasant surprise when we woke up the following morning and discovered it was Donald Trump. What was very interesting when we asked the Taliban was their view was, well, what's the big deal? I mean, they saw all American presidents as equally corrupt, as equally untrustworthy partners. And for me, the interesting thing was it really brought home the political naivety of the Taliban. So they were they turned out to be strategically very wily players. They played they played a good game actually, but politically in some respects quite naive because it is, you know, it is no it's unquestionably the case that a Trump was a very different uh, political character. To say with any seriousness that there was no difference in the political character of, of an Obama administration versus Trump is just. It's either disingenuous or naive, and I think it was the opposite. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. I think that you know, just our discussion of Tony Blair shows that what one person in power, the agency of an individual leader, have, what impact that can have on a war, on a conflict. And of course, Biden, with the decision then to withdraw immediately, it had, it had massive and sustained effects on a society. But in your discussions with the Taliban, did you get the sense that they thought it was just a matter of time? They knew they were always going to win this, that they would be able to outlast any sort of American Western coalition commitment. So the Taliban would certainly have say that. And, you know, there was this a phrase that, you know, that's that classic phrase around, you know, the West has the clocks, the Taliban has all the time. And, but it's obviously been used in other contexts. But in reality, there was intense debate within the Taliban. By 2010, the West had brought very considerable military force to bear on the Taliban. Taliban casualties, and, and we did a piece of work looking at the Taliban campaign in Helmand, interviewing, sending Afghan researchers to interview Taliban on the ground. We got a pretty good picture of what, what the campaign looked like for them. And they were building capacities around governance, yes. And they were organizing, there was ever more sophisticated organization of Taliban military forces. So, I mean, the conflict is partly, it's very locally based, it's about local rivalries, but that aggregates up in, into what are Taliban military forces. And there was ever more sophistication by 20, 2009 and by 2010 but they also suffered very heavy casualties. I mean, unquestionably the case. And the the Western forces got better and better at targeting Taliban. I think we underestimate the intensity of some of the battles in Afghanistan, the waves of Taliban fighters that would just be coming in their droves over and over again, being mowed down by Western forces. The commitment was there. The cost is unimaginable. Absolutely. Look, absolutely. I think that's absolutely the case. And so there was debate within the Taliban about, so they were interested in exploring what, you know, peace talks, if only perhaps conflict de-escalation to buy space for themselves. And look, that can be a, a route to de-escalating the conflict more broadly. Even if, for instance, one side wants to have a temporary ceasefire suspension of hostilities just to regroup, it can also lead to a momentum towards peace. And so I discussed the point you were making earlier about tipping point, and, you know, you and I who study wars know there's a reason why war is an art, not a science, because at some point there is a tipping point and suddenly the war takes momentum of its own. And, you know, time and again in history, you want to see this. The ripe time for peace, I think it's called in the literature. Yeah, there is, there is, a, there is, exactly, that's exactly right. Now, for the West to get serious about talks of the Taliban, 2010 would have been a ripe time. It was the high point of Western force deployed in Afghanistan. It was just before the Obama begins to draw down Western forces out of Afghanistan. It would have been a really good time to talk to the Taliban because they were really hurting. And in fact, what you have is Richard Holbrook, who is the U.S. Uh, special representative, representative for the, uh, uh, President Obama, who actually wants to get serious about uh, starting peace talks. He, at that point, General Crystal is replaced by General Petraeus, a man who famously won the war in Iraq, supposedly. Petraeus is determined to achieve further a military victory against the Taliban. And uh, when Richard Holbrook in late 2010 says to Petraeus, you know, I want to talk to you about the possibility of talks to the Taliban, Petraeus says, that's a 10 second discussion. No, not now. That's what he says. And that's the mistake because what happens thereafter is Western forces begin to draw down. Then the Taliban begins to see the momentum is moving in a different direction. We do see embryonic talks within the Taliban, certain moves from 2011 
There's a, a Taliban embassy that's established in Doha in 2012, but that then collapses quite quickly. There's some talks in 2015, but already by then, things have moved on. So by the time it gets to 2015, there's still concern within the Taliban about, you know, the cost of the war on the movement and on their people. But broadly speaking, we begin to see the momentum slowly begin to move in the other direction. So the moment has passed. I think we can safely say that the eyes of the world have moved on to new wars, specifically a war that has erupted in Europe, the war in Ukraine. So perhaps you could bring us up to date. What has happened since that withdrawal in August 2021 to the point that we're at in 2023? Are we at a moment where potentially in the future Afghanistan could once again be a safe haven for terrorists, be a threat to the West? Uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, so what we have is a Taliban government that's come into power, led by a, a very hard line uh, leader, um, Habitullah Aghazada. And, and you've got kind of a return to what the Taliban were like in the 1990s in many respects. So you've got a clerical court uh, around the emir, Habitullah Aghazada, in Kandahar, a very hard line. And you've got a Taliban administration in Kabul. And you will have some elements from the Taliban that are a bit more moderate. They just try to get on and govern the country. But the more hardline elements are the ascendancy. The one difference between the... And in many respects, we've seen all of the, the things we saw in the 1990s. The restrictions on everyday life for people in Afghanistan, on men and women, but particularly on women. The disappearance of women from public space. So most infamous of all is being the banning of women and young and girls from school. So... And now public parks. Public parks, university, with the requirement for women to wear, um, to fully cover themselves or wear the burqa. And of course, basically not enabling to get access to employment or to health care. So you is gender apartheid, the most appalling form of gender apartheid. Um, half of the Afghan population is a consequence of suffering. Then you have the compound effects that collapse the Afghan economy, which at that stage had been heavily, heavily dependent on the inflow of Western cash, basically. And of course... The war in Ukraine has caused a problem for food security, has it had a direct impact on the price of grain that has hit the economy in Afghanistan. So, I mean, you have got, you know, millions of people in Afghanistan uh, suffering chronic food insecurity. You've got millions of children on the verge of starvation. You know, Western aid organizations have been operating, keeping these people alive. But now, of course, many Western aid organizations have withdrawn from Afghanistan because of Taliban rules banning females from working for aid organizations. So it's for the Afghan people, it's appalling. It's absolutely appalling situation. For Afghan women, it's it's hell on earth. It's 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 a disgrace. But of course, the West has no appetite to engage into anything because we are focused on bigger strategic concerns. Uh, particularly of course the war in Ukraine, but also in this part of the world, potential rise of China. And there there is a chip war going on. Yep. Semiconductors and microchips and everything else. It's uh it's a, a silent war that is happening in the background. Well, what's quite interesting, you've been obviously in, in Sydney for a few days, but the press is frequent articles and has been for years in the Australian press about the potential for war with China as a real prospect in the coming few years. And today, of course, you're going to see the Australian Prime Minister and the British Prime Minister and the American President announce the deal that will see Australia acquire eight nuclear subs costing $200 billion at least over the coming decade plus. So, you know, they're, they're nuclear powered submarines. Correct. They're not going to be armed with nuclear missiles. Because I heard this on the radio this morning as well. And there's a big difference between the two. That is correct. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And at the same time, of course, it indicates the extent to which the potential for armed conflict with China is a very live politically concern in Australia. And so Afghanistan has just disappeared off people's radars. Yeah. And the problem here is that currently there's no path to engaging in constructed diplomatic relations with the Taliban. That is the problem. And ironically, actually, they probably would be very keen to have diplomatic relations with the West. And that was indeed the case already in the late 1990s. So they would be very interested in constructive dialogue with the West, potentially seeing, you know, Western investment in Afghanistan. They, this would all be perfectly fine for them. The reason why the, we can't have that, of course, is because the West find that the theology of the Taliban regime, and particularly the treatment of women, so abhorrent that it simply makes it impossible for us to deal with the Taliban. And so that's this kind of, we're in a bind now. And interesting enough, the one thing I learned from my talks with the Taliban, you know, way back in 2011 and so forth, was 
the Taliban were prepared to show flexibility in all sorts of ways, including, you know, kicking terrorist groups out of their country. But the one thing that they weren't going to compromise on were their theological beliefs around the appropriate place of women in society. And this is medieval, basically. And so that's the kind of bind we're in. It's very hard to see a way forward. And so instead, the only levers we have to try and impact in Taliban behavior are sanctions. And they're not having much effect. Aggressively blunt sanctions as well. And all of this becomes incredibly tragic when you move back to Blair's original intentions to go to war to emancipate the women of Afghanistan. And you see how tragically that has failed in the long term. And when the West doesn't provide support for the country, and you know, you outline the reasons quite clearly why it allows other regimes, perhaps hostile to the West, perhaps more akin to the Taliban to come in and to support that regime, creating just a next generation of anonymity and animosity. Theo, thank you so much for your time today, for inviting us into your home. You've mentioned the book once, but I'm going to give you the time. Tell us, what is the title of the book? Where can we buy it? Uh, it's called Unwinnable Britain's War in Afghanistan. It's available at all good bookstores and I dare say Amazon. You're always welcome on the Warfare Podcast. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. But before you go, a reminder that you can now follow along online on Twitter at HistoryHitWW2, on Instagram at James Rogers History, and on TikTok also at James Rogers History. You can also subscribe to our free Warfare Wednesdays newsletter via the link in the show notes. <laughs>